Okay. Let me just bring up two images here. My mouse doesn't seem to be scrolling very nicely. Sorry about that. So here we have two images done several years apart, as you can see there. Uh, the finding on this one over here is dilatation of the pulmonary arteries. So conspicuously main pulmonary artery, left and right. I do not see any dilated pulmonary veins. So certainly this is not a manifestation, for example, of chronic pulmonary venous hypertension, nor do we see distended pulmonary veins and a balanced distribution of pulmonary blood flow to suggest the possibility of a left to right shunt. But certainly there are findings different from before, consistent with pulmonary hypertension. And certainly this patient um, was discovered to have that. And this patient by history has HHT. So she has a long history of recurrent epistaxis and telangiectasias. She doesn't have large AVMs in organs, so like the lung or the liver, for example. And you can see from a cardiac cath, this goes back to 2015, that she has findings of so-called precapillary pulmonary hypertension. So the mean pulmonary artery pressure is 59. Uh, left atrial pressure is not elevated. Pulmonary vascular resistance is high. So there's certainly a pathologic process affecting small precapillary vessels. And then I couldn't quite remember, because I don't usually associate or think about pulmonary hypertension in the context of HHT. So I went back to the group classification and sure enough in group one, there is one item here for these strange genetic syndromes, I guess, that I know nothing about. Uh, one of which is associated with, as you can see there, HHT. So I went to Dr. Google and looked for pulmonary hypertension in HHT, and let me see if I can find that. I think I may have put it somewhere, or a summary of it. Let me see. Oh, I thought I did, but maybe I didn't. But I found a couple of articles about pulmonary hypertension in HHT, and usually they talk about two. One is a high flow state, which we don't have here, with an increased cardiac output, and the other one is this one here, which is a not well understood precapillary pulmonary hypertension. And you can find articles that do in fact mention the association with some of these uh, strange genetic abnormalities as we see here. So this is the first patient that I think I have seen in which the pulmonary hypertension has been attributed to this particular entity. Have you ever seen or thought about that before? Or had a patient in with significant pulmonary hypertension and HHT. I think we've seen one here. I don't remember specifically, but um, yeah, it's something with the, some of the genetics that can do it. I've also, the ones that have really large shunts sometimes do it, even if they're treated later on. But I think most of them present with hemoptysis and other symptoms before they get hypertension. Yeah. And one of my colleagues just texted me and says, we do have several cases here, so we have seen them. Of this particular entity, okay. Um, I do want to show you. Howard, the other interesting thing that happened with with this condition is sometimes when the lesions are treated, we used to, you know, they used to resect them, but you can embolize them. That can trigger a malignant pulmonary hypertension with rapidly expanding pulmonary arteries and so forth. So there, ha there has been a tie on a, a tie in at least to treating this condition uh, oh. that can lead to malignant pulmonary hypertension. And I think we've also we've also seen a couple of cases where people had pulmonary hypertension as part of the presentation before treatment. Okay. Um, here is the realm of speculation. So this is the same patient, 
And when I started scrolling through this, I began to notice in between the opacified pulmonary arteries and the veins, small smudges, and I hope they show up on your screen. So these are multiple small ground glass attenuating centrilobular smudges of opacity. So I think this is a manifestation of the severity of a pulmonary hypertension. We've seen this so-called neovascularity um, before. We've shown examples of it in this conference in context of pulmonary hypertension. So I think it's kind of interesting and the likely etiology or presumed etiology, I speculate, of these smudges is a neovascularity in the lung. Now, I'm, not refer I'm not referring to so-called plexiform lesions, but just a funny strange proliferation of capillaries in relation to interalveolar receptor and vessels that have been described in patients with severe pulmonary hypertension. So I wonder whether she has that as well. All right, let me show you this one. So this patient kind of started off as best as I, as I could tell with a pleural effusion of unknown etiology. Uh, she does have a loop recorder there. I think it's a loop recorder and you can see the pleural fluid. I don't know how long they followed that for, for sure. Let me just be sure about the loop recorder. Yep. But ultimately at some point they did a CT. So I'm going to show you that. And I'm going to show you the more recent CT. So of course, down here we have pleural fluid. But when you have pleural fluid, and this is kind of instructive, and it's idiopathic, and you're looking for a potential cause, I will say I've become attuned to looking very carefully at pleural surfaces. And one location that I saw it in this patient is up here. And this is fairly easy to go by if you're scrolling relatively fast through a series because there isn't that much opacity there. But here you can see mild lobulated thickening of pleural membranes involving the left upper low paramediastinal pleural surface. And really that's it. Present that way. What I didn't appreciate was further down and I'll show you the PET CT in a moment, but we can see fluid coming down, down the lateral recess and quite a bit of it going down adjacent to spleen. And this I didn't really observe when I reported the CT, I reported the abnormal pleural membranes. But the lesson here I think is any time down here, even if the space is occupied by fluid, any convexity of that should be concerning. And she did, even she have a pet, and you'll see there that there is abnormal opacity there, and you can see there is some FDG avidity associated with that. There was another focus higher up, which I couldn't appreciate on the on the CT right there. So this is a mesothelioma, and I will show you some of the pretty typical. She did have this diagnosed via VATS some of the typical <clears throat> cell surface. So they typically are positive for these particular things, calretin and WT1 rather than TTF1. So this is a, a malignant mesothelioma. It's a female patient and I didn't see findings suggestive of asbestos. But I always teach that evaluate the pleural surfaces really carefully. This is back in 15, in which case, and interestingly, I can't remember if I saw this, this pleural fluid there at that time, but the pleural thickening I'm showing you up here is, is a new finding. So I don't know if this is actually a manifestation of it back in 2015, probably not. All right. This one is just really an interesting presentation of something we've seen a lot of. So I will show you the chest radiographs and not too much to see on this radiograph actually. The patient does have a cardiomyopathy, so the heart is a little enlarged. I didn't interpret these earlier ones, so I'm not quite sure what the symptoms were, but 
here we have some pleural fluid and in a moment you'll see how much opacity is actually present in that lower chest. So go forward two days from then and on this radiograph if you look down here you don't see very much but there's something abnormal down here. And now I'll show you the CT from the 8th and if we go down here you will see really dramatic findings that have an appearance in morphology very typical for acute pulmonary embolism. So we have multiple pleural based opacities and we can see that some of these as opposed to the surrounding atelectatic lung do not enhance. They have a very distinctive appearance internally that I'm not sure how to describe but it's a very distinctive appearance of strange aeration right in there and in there and in there. And even though I couldn't find emboli in vessels going to those regions, I consider that very typical of areas of pulmonary hemorrhage infarction. He did have a DVT, so this is very typical of rather large areas of pulmonary hemorrhage and infarction. So that is the seventh. So just in terms of follow-up, what happens to these things? They kind of melt away. So now the 20th, you'll see that the opacities are now much more circumscribed. That's the point at which I begin to think of real Hampton's humps. And I wonder how much of these opacities are going to remain as areas of true collagenized pale infarction. But actually, going even further in time, so sorry about that, let me go back to that. So now we have that period of time. These have resolved and perhaps they, they are very small opacities that remain in the same areas. So I think this is a really nice example of the evolution of pulmonary embolism over time. Very nice. Yeah, and Howard, the other point to make too is the fact that the patient, as you pointed out, has a cardiomyopathy. The left ventricular failure yes. predisposes to hemorrhagic infarction too. Yeah, that's what I read too. Yeah. Because you have so, increased you have increased downstream hydrostatic pressure. And I think that's there was that nice radiographics article a decade ago talking about the physiology of infarcts. Sorry about that. Yeah. So yeah. Even without sorry, I'm trying to get back to the media stanal windows. Yeah, I'm just assuming that the vessels in this particular person that were occluded were so small and so peripheral that we simply cannot see them in the midst of all these things. I looked as carefully as I could and I couldn't find vessels. But if anyone was inclined to say, well, that can't be pulmonary embolism, we don't see emboli elsewhere. Nope, this is super distinctive. Obviously, we might see something like this in patients who are immunosuppressed to have an invasive fungal infection. But with the DVT and a clinical context, very good for PE. This is absolutely typical for PE. Cool. Oh, yeah, and, and nine out of 10 radiologists will call it pneumonia too. Not thoracic radiologists, but general. And I, I agree with you though, it's an important point to make that that's characteristic of infarct. Yeah. Yeah, with the caveat that it's, yeah, I mean, with this number, but I, I've seen cases of mucor that look exactly like that, but they're usually solitary and the patients are being suppressed. Oh, sure. Yeah. As yeah, yeah. Howard made that point. Yeah. Yeah. But it's, it's a similar concept because it's still hammer, you know, it's angio invasion, right? An occlusion of the right. pulmonary artery from the mucor. Yeah. Component may be the same kind of thing. Yep. Uh, let me show you this one. So this is a patient that has metastatic colon cancer, I believe. Let me bring up alongside a previous one and go to the thin cuts and show you a couple of interesting findings. So the time difference here is relatively short, but this patient on the left side, as I'll show you in a moment, has findings uh, very distinctive for number one, looking at the fissures. I consider this appearance where we see little focal opacities related to the interlobe of fissures, but quite extensive all the way up and down. Very typical of deposits of tumor in the interlobe fissures along the pleural surfaces. And you can see 
that it's progressed and it's rather extensive. It's focal, but it's multifocal all along the pleural surfaces, as you can see there. I mean, you've seen that before, but when I see that, I have a high confidence in a patient with cancer that it's tumor, that it's pleural metastasis. I've seen it in ovarian cancer, for example. The other thing I want to show you on this exam is that when I scroll around in this patient, I saw lots of focal opacities, but they weren't quite round. And some of them, like this one here, and I'll just blow this one up, um, was fairly easy traceable, I thought, to a pulmonary vessel. And it seemed to want to branch just like that. And I found quite a few of these, relatively small, but just like this, they were enlarging in size and towards the ends of pulmonary artery branches. So I think this is a nice example of a patient that has developed intravascular tumor deposits that are growing. So as I scroll around here, let's see if I can find another one that kind of looks that way. But there are some others here that I think maybe that is an example where you seem to see an opacity, but it's lobulated and it seems to want to fork and, and grow down two vessels. And this is the kind of thing if you spend a lot of time just scrolling through a thin series, as well as in other dimensions that you can see findings very consistent with intravascular metastases. So I thought these, this was an interesting case of the morphology of intravascular and pleural surface. Let me just make this one for you guys, um, a coronal, just to show you the studying of the pleura again. If I had the right one. Please look at the interlobar fissures and see that studying appearance. Have you guys seen that before or thought about that before? Look at it here, quite quite dramatically up here, like that. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Yeah. Example. Yeah, I think it's it's very distinctive in my experience. You don't see it very often, but when I do see that in a cancer patient, I'm typically pretty confident in suggesting pleural surface metastases. Right, especially when you have the prior normal for comparison. Yeah, and you can see it getting worse. Exactly, yep. All right, Jeff, those are my cases right. for this week. Thank you, Howard. Who would like to go next? I have a couple of cases to show. All right. Yeah, let David go. So this is a case actually from, from University of Utah that has transferred to this area. This is a man, and Howard may, probably will recognize this case. This is a man who has um, longstanding rheumatoid arthritis and was treated with uh, Enbrel from 2008 forward. And um, I will tell you that at this point, um, he has a big nodule in his right lung base. And at an earlier CT scan, which I don't, actually don't have available, I thought I had it here to show you, there was a very similar lesion in the left lower lobe months before. And that was, uh, there was a needle aspirate or a needle biopsy that disclosed a fungal infection. It was a species of aspergillus. So now we have, a, you know, several months later, we have a very similar looking lesion in the right lung base, also suspicious for fungal infection. And this needle, uh, this was biopsied, and this turns out to be a rheumatoid um, lung nodule here. So it was a necrobiotic or macrobiotic, depending on your diet preferences, uh, nodule down here, not a fungal infection after all. And his, because of the fungal infections, his immune suppression had been withdrawn. So it was actually, I think, declining at this point. He'd, he'd been off his immune suppression for some time. This was a rheumatoid nodule, very similar appearance earlier in this same man's course had been a fungal infection. So yeah, I do remember the case now that you mentioned it. Um, uh, part of the discussion here, I remember, which was quite interesting, was if you have a patient with, and he may have had waxing and waning nodules, but he had nodules, and as you say, I think a biopsy or a CT guide perhaps had aspergillus. Mm -hmm. The pulmonary physician said, do you think this could be that entity of bronchocentric granulomatosis. And mm -hmm. I said, yeah, I guess it could be. 
so yeah, what you what you described comes back to me now. I think I have seen images of this patient. So he also has he also has bronchiectasis. He probably has some air trapping because there's a lot of mosaic attenuation here, but I never saw expiratory views. But with his yes. bronchiectasis, he has now been colonized with stenotrophomonas, so he has a variety of infections going on. Um, okay. Probably not made any better by the immune suppression and things like that. So he's now a lung transplant candidate here. So, for the bronchiolitis and ends. Right. I think there's. There, it's probably there. There's. You know. There. There is mosaic attenuation for sure. Yes. yes. Probably yes. obliterative bronchiolitis. Okay. Well, David, uh, two points. First of all, I think the what looks like ground glass in this patient is probably the normal lung. I, that looks like a pretty dark. That's lung. Right. Yeah, that's right. The black lung is the normal lung. The clear lung is bad lung in this, right. this, this occasion. Right. Mm -hmm. The second point is Howard mentioned that entity of bronchocentric granulomatosis, and I think it's important to clarify that it's not a disease. That In the older books and literature, it's often described as a disease associated with aspergillus. It's, um, if you talk to the pulmonary pathologist, it's, they now refer to it as bronchocentric granulomatous inflammation. It's a pattern of granulomatous injury in the lung, and it's not always associated with aspergillus, but... Um, you can see it as a chronic cause of sort of airway or per air inflammation around many of the airways. Um, mm -hmm. So I think that's important to remember. So I, I never accept it as a diagnosis or give it as a diagnosis when someone says, oh, could this be that? But rather it's, it's a tissue reaction frequently to aspergillus, which may not even be, it may only be centered around the airways. Yeah, so that, that occurs in people who, are, who have other findings like allergic bronchopulmonary aspergillosis and asthma and things like that. And, um, and it's more diffuse, as, as I recall, but I've never, seen, I've never seen a convincing case of it. And certainly if you have a discrete nodule, as in this case, in the right lung base, I don't think I would invoke that because, uh, you know, this, this, is, this seems to be a discrete fungal infection. It turns out to be not a fungal infection, but a rheumatoid nodule. But it's, and he does have diffuse bronchial disease, but he's had that for years too. So, yeah. Yeah. right. It's probably more that they get colonization of their airways with a little bit of you know, granulomatous right. response. And, you know, the cases that have been described, and I think it's been associated with ABPA, um, as you mentioned, it, it's probably just an incomplete biopsy. Well, I, yeah, I showed a case last week of ABPA with a component of bronchocentric granulomatosis, they thought, because it had the, the necrotizing granulomatous inflammation in the airways. Mm -hmm. But as you say, it's not like, it wasn't the specific diagnosis because the diagnosis was still ABPA. Yeah. Right. So it's part of the part of the response to, part of an allergic response to aspergillus and maybe other, other things. Okay, so let me show you this uh, this this case. Here's a um, a young woman, and I'll show you an early chest radiograph in her. I think I've got an early chest radiograph. Okay, she uh, presented to the emergency room with um, fever and cough, and has this fluid level down here. It looks like pretty amazingly bad left lower lobe, and uh, she's in her I think young twenties. Here's what CT looked like around that time in the emergency room. And you can see that there is a multi-cystic lesion in the left lower lobe here with fluid levels looking pretty bad. There's no systemic arterial supply to this left lower lobe. And this lesion was uh, ultimately resected and was shown to be a uh, CPAM. So cystic adenomatoid malformation, what we used to call is now CPAM. Okay, and so it was an infected CPAM, and that was removed. And um, she, you know, she had symptoms. She had vague chest pain and, you know, other problems. Then she had this radiograph just a few months after her resection. Now she has this funny uh, bulge of gut up into the chest. She had a CT scan in this era, which shows, I'll just show you the, so it's a hernia, probably a surgically induced hernia, through her left hemidiaphragm. And so a surgical complication. And then ultimately she had that repaired. And her radiograph then after this shows lobectomy, her left lower lobectomy, these central clips, 
sort of um, low lung volume here. She's a little overweight and a more normal contour now of left hemi diaphragm. It's still a little lumpy and probably some pleural effusion or thickening at this point. So um, infected CPAM, resection, surgical complication of diaphragmatic hernia, second repair, and uh, ultimately reasonable status at this, at this juncture. And hopefully never to go to the hospital again. Yeah, she's, you know, probably stay away from the hospitals, lady. You'll be better off. Okay, those are the two cases I wanted to show. Thank you, David. Thank you. All righty. Who's up next? Hi, Hi Travis. Or Travis. Better. Oh, okay. Wait, let me hide that. You win. <laughs> oh, yes, now my, my day is complete. <laughs> um, this is, I don't know what to make of this case. This is an interesting case. Um, this is a young gentleman with Klein filters who presented in 2012 with a large mediastinal mass that was causing SVC syndrome. And uh, there's a association with Kleinfelters and germ cell tumors, usually benign teratomas, but can get malignant ones as well. And he was uh, treated with the standard therapy of whatever chemo they give for these. And they then went in and resected the majority of the mass. And I think I show one of these similar kind of outcomes where you know, by the time they treated him and biopsied the mass, they got um, benign teratoma. And presumably because it wasn't a metastasizing benign teratoma, but it was a teratoma or mixed germ cell tumor where they killed off all the malignant cells and all that was left was the teratominous portion. And so it's interesting that he has all these pulmonary masses and a bunch of these have been taken out at times because they are growing uh, and they are quite large, and they have been diagnosed on explant as teratomas. Um, so presumably, unfortunately, we don't have the imaging from him in 2012, presumably that these were all metastasis and they killed off the malignant cells, and these are growing because there's still some tumor in it, but they're benign tumor, uh, and it's just a person with filled with now teratomas everywhere. I, I just had not seen that to some extent this extent before. I thought that was interesting. Um, yeah. yeah, it's just a bizarre, bizarre case. So these, uh, the lung lesions were there before his resection or only well, after? You know what? I have to, I have to fi figure that out. It, it's very, he didn't come here until like 2016. Um, and I'm not sure about the lung lesions, about where they were, if they were there. All I know is that they took out or they biopsied the, it was a very large mass in the mediastinum. It came back as teratoma after treatment and that a few of these have been wedged out. You can see surgical suture down here and they all came back as teratoma. I mean, it's theoretically possible that these were um, in the lung uh, after that, like after he was treated and somehow got there uh, via maybe surgical and embolization of material surgically, who knows, or of, you know, benign lesions surgically because it's in his SVC. Maybe it's breaking off the SVC and embolizing out to the lung um, and growing there. Uh, that's that's another possibility. I, I don't have records. Were you thinking of something else? And a lot of these are calcification, right? In the bit. Yeah, these are all. A lot of these have calcification. Of course, calcification. Probably, probably cartilaginous calcification. Yeah. Yeah, so, um, you know, I, I, you know, since I think the thing was probably involving the cave ahead of time, and I think your yeah, uh, notion was that it was probably already in the lung when they resected the main mass and they killed all the malignant cells in mediastinum and probably already in lung. Yes, that that would be my guess too. Yeah, cool. And, that, and then the benign teratominous pores because they grow has just been growing. Right. Um, and I have two two studies that show that there's some interval growth. This is a yeah, it's a neat case just because it is what it is. Not dramatic. It looks like a mediastinal cyst. I don't have to send over. Uh, I didn't have time to anonymize. Um, this was discovered on a incidentally on a breast MR, and uh, on the breast MR, I don't think you can see it. Nah, not really. Um, 
on this thin sections, which are here, but they're very noisy, um, you can maybe make out some septations. Anyways, on MRI, it's more septated. And this was resected, and this turned out to be a uh, pericardial lymphangioma. So we know lymphangiomas can occur in multiple portions of the mediastinum, but they can also be within the pericardium. So this was a path-proven pericardial lymphangioma. And this is an interesting case, and I'd like to get your opinion. I have pretty strong opinions, which I've let all my guys know what I think this is. Uh, this is a woman who was in a trauma um, and was has been seen here for lung transplant clinic. We can see there's quite a large uh, RV without uh, question. PA is quite robust. And then we have this disease in the lungs. And to me, this disease is made up of both truly cystic elements. But if you look, a lot of this uh, are areas of emphysema. We can see uh, that, you know, a lot of uh, pulmonary arterial going through there and some, this is not, here's a good one. So some of these are emphysematous spaces as well. Um, Cause the main differential diagnosis is what I think this is and potentially lymphangiolimimatosis. Uh, you can see that the bases are spared, the right, you know, the anterior lung is spared mm -hmm. down here. It looks relatively normal. Um, and I think personally that this is, I, I don't have path. She's on the transplant list that this is going to be a case of end-stage PLCH. Uh, this is a 45-year-old woman. She smokes two packs a day, uh, has had known to have a quote-unquote cystic lung disease uh, for many, many years, and um, has the diagnosis of not approved, just a her being a woman with you know a <laughs> cystic lung disease, a diagnosis of LAM. Uh, but I don't like it for LAM. I like it more for um, end stage PLCH, but I was curious what anyone else thought. I think we're all going to be in consensus with yeah. you on this one. And the, okay. the, the the presence of pulmonary hypertension further supports that. Exactly. I mean, that degree yeah. of pulmonary hypertension you don't get from lamb. Yeah, or emphysema. <laughs> or emphysema, yeah. Oh, really? So you see more. Oh, that's interesting. Oh, yeah. It's been described to occur sort of as an independent process. I don't, I've never been able to tease out what the mechanism is, but. Oh, I did not know that. Oh, that's yeah, actually. It's, it's considered, isn't it considered group five? Yes. Hypertension? Yeah. Yeah. That's a good point, though. Oh, that's interesting. I just thought it was a kind of smoking related emphysema, sim, similar emphysema, but oh, that's interesting. I did not, did not know that. Okay. So yeah, I think that runs on the coronal images, and you look in the upper lung zones, you can appreciate how bizarre and irregularly shaped these spaces are. Right, and so as these cysts form, you know, we know that these nodules form on the airways, and they start to cavitate the airways, and then they kind of collapse down on themselves. And so you still have some cysts, but as these things collapse down on themselves, they uh, create this pronounced um, cicatricial emphysema as they collapse. These nodules or cysts collapse down, and so. I mean, I'm sure some of the emphysema is central lobular from smoking, but some of it is, I'm sure, related to uh, the natural progression of this, where you get cicatricial emphysema in areas as these cysts collapse down and cause fibrosis and tethering of the surrounding lung. Uh, I think so, if you took a screenshot of that one coronal image of the right upper lobe where it was quite extensive, and you just sent it to everybody and said, quick diagnosis. Yeah. That everyone, I think, would be. PLCH, if you just took a screenshot of, so I of thought that, that one. Was, yeah. yeah. I think the, the thick walls also support it. And um, you know, the, the wall thickening reflects the fibrosis. You know, this is an inflammatory condition. And so yes. you get wall thickening and you get distortion, you get scarring. Whereas LAM leaves the, you know, does not cause fibrosis. Therefore, the cyst walls are pristine and you don't see the distortion in the lungs. Very elo more eloquently stated than my saying it it is because it is. No, I, it is because it I, is. Yeah, sister. No, I know. I, I said you know I described a little, but not as some of the points you guys point out was quite good. And this, unfortunately, the other, I'll show this because it's just bizarre. Um, Sharon, one of my colleagues, showed me this. This is a woman who has breast cancer. Um, she has a pericardial cyst or some presumed pericardial cyst. It's been there. It's been there for forever. Um, she has studies going out before she has metastatic disease. It's sitting there. It's happy as a clam, not doing anything. 
Um, and I have studies showing the progression of this. Let me just, uh, so her disease, unfortunately, goes downhill um, over a few years. And what's fascinating is that you start to see that this cyst develops areas of nodular, nodular thickening on the cyst. And it's all over the place. Again, I'm wanting the image, when, well, let me download, I'll send it. But it's METs involving a pericardial cyst. Um, either by, I mean, she's got tumor in the heart. I mean, she's got disease everywhere. Either by, whoop, whoop, that's something else, either by direct invasion and seeding of it, or theoretically, I don't even know, may, potentially hematogenous. My guess it's got to be direct seeding. Uh, there's tumor all around it. But, what if, uh, so, Seth, what about the possibility that this pericardial cyst actually is not a true cyst, but communicates with the pericardium? A pericardial diverticulum. Um, so, that, so that's a very good point i will so i have multiple studies over many years and most pericardial quote-unquote diverticular outpouchings that i've seen um change in size over the time because it's just a sometimes they're there sometimes they're smaller bigger uh sometimes even disappear True. this had this had stayed unchanged uh over many years in size uh but the answer is you it could be it could absolutely be a pericardial diverticulum and that since the pericardium got seeded with tumor that hence that seeded the cyst that, that's 100 percent positive or it could be that it's a narrow communication and that alterations yep. in pericardial pressure change it because i've seen Absolutely. some that kind of hang out for a while and then i i showed a case i think it was a couple of years ago of one that was pretty big and then on the follow-up study it was gone because it had spontaneously emptied back into the main pericardium. yes yeah hmm. um I have seen those and no, that's, that is a good point. Uh, they can, it, it could, there could be some persistent small communication and it could have seeded that way. Cause there is definitely pericardial mets on the, whatever the stuff. mechanism, it's really cool. Yeah. But, uh, those are my cases. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Travis. All right. We're going to, I'm going to show this really quick. You should see a PowerPoint. This is from the Mallinckrodt archives. And when Seth showed his case last week, it made me think of this. I had to go dig it up. It's a lady who has this big mass you can see in her right heart and it extends up. This is all contiguous. She also has probably some bland pulmonary emboli, but this is all part of the same thing. And sure enough, you see that she has a leiomyoma. This is in the IVC. So this you know, is a companion to what Seth showed last week where he had more, it had broken off and I guess metastasized or at least embolized to the pulmonary artery. This was one big continu continuous lyomyoma that had invaded into the IVC all the way up into the pulmonary artery. I've not seen, I've seen that with lyomyosarcomas, but never benign lyomyoma. I've never seen it do that. Yeah, That's it was, so it was kind of like, I mean, it was similar to yours. This was just contiguous. Yeah. So, and continuous. That's pretty so, cool. But this, yeah, so that was the gross from it. This was an all an intravenous lyomyoma. So that's that's an old case from when I was a resident. I just wanted to show that really quick. This is one of my favorite cases of probably my favorite case of 2018 so far, just because it turned out as usually, you know, the best cases are the ones you're right on. Uh, this is a otherwise boring PE study from the other night. This is a 21-year-old woman. And scrolling through it with a resident, the resident who was reading it in the morning from overnight and said there's nothing going on except I can't really explain why there's a little bit of fluid around the the liver right here. And you notice there's a little bit of hyperemia in the liver. So my first question to him was, you know, which side is her symptoms on? And so, sure enough, she had right-sided chest pain. And it sounded kind of pleuritic. And when we dug in the chart, it was actually radiating up to her shoulder. So we thought, well, maybe this is the cause. This is the best we could do. And I said to him, you know, it's like, have they checked a, a STD panel? Could this be Fitzhugh-Curtis syndrome? Like pelvic inflammatory disease. She's of reproductive age. And I didn't know what was going on here. If this is just, I think the spleen is actually normal there. Uh, but to make a long story short, this was the only abnormality on there. And they did, in fact, go back and check a panel, and chlamydia was positive. And so they're treating this as a Fitzhugh Curtis syndrome based on this finding. This was the only thing on there. And she was otherwise, from a, from a respiratory standpoint, was completely asymptomatic that she was afebrile and she just has a positive D-dimer, which is what prompted this anyway in the waiting room. 
So I don't know if anybody's made the diagnosis of Fitzhugh Curtis before on a CT, but this is kind of, I, I had seen a couple of cases as a resident. And in fact, Jeff uh, Perry Pickert wrote one of the first case reports of it on at least on abdomen and pelvis CT. But I was able to find this, um, they call it Fitzhugh and Curtis syndrome here. But this, this was a, a picture, some nice little illustrations, very similar in patients with confirmed cases where you just get this small amount of fluid and then a little bit of hyperemia. And now they're showing arterial and delayed. And obviously we only have an arterial phase here, but it's again, an explanation for why somebody would have right-sided chest pain. And in, in my reading, you can see this perihepatitis, even if they don't have other overt signs of, of pelvic inflammatory disease, which she did not. So uh, please tell me, what, what's the mechanism here, Travis? Is this, is, this a, is this a hepatitis or is this a... So it's, so it's, uh, it's a, a peritonitis. It's what? It's a perihepatitis. Yeah, perihepatitis or peritonitis. So the idea is that the bugs get into the peritoneal cavity and spread and seed along the, the surface of the liver, as you see here, and cause irritation of the diaphragm. And that's why these can present mimicking PE. And so they can confirm it if they did a lap and found adhesions and grew bugs out of this. But this is kind of the finding that you would see in these cases. So Travis, wow. they are correct in calling it Fitzhugh and Curtis syndrome because Fitzhugh was one person. Yeah, right. Yeah, I, I saw that when I was looking through one of the other, the other articles. But yeah, they're calling it Fitzhugh and Curtis instead of just Fitzhugh Curtis, which I guess we're calling it. But yeah, so it's a perihepatitis, so I guess peritonitis this in a sense too. It's peritoneal seeding from either usually gonorrhea or chlamydia. And there have been cases of tuberculous uh, pelvic inflammatory disease causing it too. Wow. That was on. That, that, that's, a, that's a home run the first uh, first month of the year. Yeah, you should that was a fun one. Well, this was all on Tuesday. Things things uh, keep going, getting somewhat better here. Well, not, I don't know better, but this was this was a lady. Uh, let's see. This was on the eighth. So she's two weeks post right upper lobectomy. Also had a right lower lobe wedge, and this is her radiograph coming in. and And she came back in with fever and a little bit of right sided chest pain. And you can see here that you know she's got maybe a little bit of fluid. I don't know. There's a, obviously a lot of volume loss from the surgery here. Um, and yeah, I didn't see this radiograph only in retrospect. I, I saw the CT, and this was the same night. And sure enough, you see that this consolidated lung that's plastered medially here, and then you get into the vessels and you can see, so it was a right upper lobectomy. So we can see that the right upper lobe bronchus is gone. Here's the right middle lobe bronchus, which just abruptly cuts off right here. And then I think this is probably the right middle lobe artery right here that just kind of does a little twirl as it comes upward into this consolidated lung right there. And so I was immediately suspicious of torsion. And what's interesting about this is that the pulmonary veins are still patent too, it looks like, although the, the superior pulmonary vein right here, I think maybe this is portion of the right middle lobe vein that also twists, but at least this looked like viable lung. And it wasn't as big and bulk, boggy and consolidated as some of these cases of torsion are, uh, but called the surgeon. He was a little worried about it too. And sure enough, took her to the OR yesterday and saw that the right middle lobe was at least partially torsed. It was about 180 degrees, but it was still viable. And so he had not done a PEXI, so he re-expanded it and then PEXI'd it down to the right lower lobe. Now, I guess one question on, this, on these radiographs, because even back here, I don't know, is, would this be enough for anyone to, to suspect torsion? This was a few days ago. Ooh, it would be hard. Yeah, I know, because because it was one of those things that I, I saw a few of her radiographs over the holidays and just, you know, she had had an extensive mediastinal lymph node dissection too. She's got fluid. You know, she was asymptomatic because I, I tend not to be too much of an alarmist, at least, you know, except when necessary. And it looked like it was even getting a little bit better from here, but I think it was just probably progressively collapsing on itself. I don't know. Anybody have thoughts on the radiograph? Wow. Well. Thank oh, it's that. clearly torsion on the radiograph. Oh, I would have made yeah, that. Thanks. I would have made that right after. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. <laughs> All right. Well, this and one. By, and this, that's called support, Travis. I know. I know. I know. 
Not in a million years would I have ever called that tour. First. All right. So actually, let's start with this radiograph. So this also I saw on Tuesday. It was a good day. And I know that Howard especially likes cases like this. And I'll let you look at the, the PA radiograph a little bit. You can still see, you still see the, the border of the left heart here, but you can see there's just a little bit of hazy asymmetry here. And I think if you look back to November, it's not really as visible here, but when you look at the lateral views, you'll see it's kind of interesting. So this is a, a chest wall thing going on. And we can see that it's clearly getting bigger. And it's this big mass. So this is a man who's in his early 20s. What's interesting was that after this radiograph, or after one of these, it may have been after this radiograph actually, before they went to CT, they went to mammography and they did a diagnostic mammogram and ultrasound in the young man and found this mass in his pectoralis muscle. But one thing led to another and he finally had this CT done. And you will see that this is a huge necrotic lesion destroying one of his ribs. It kind of abuts the right ventricle here. And then it was growing over the course of a few weeks. So in a 22 year old guy, anybody want to take a guess what this is? Uh, you in sarcoma or something? <laughs> TB. TB is <laughs> pretty close, of... yeah. I mean, I, I guess I would have thought tumor first and foremost destroying this. This actually turned out to be coxy. Coxy. So, is that why he has right hilar lymphadenopathy? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Sorry. That's right. I, I even forgot about that on the radiograph. You're right. Yeah. He definitely that's has, what made me think TB was the hilar. Yeah. Know. Yeah. Thank you for reminding me. Yeah. That he's got this big right hilar node there, too. So I think, yeah, TB and coxy basically equivalent because he's got tons of lymph nodes here in the mediastinum. But you're right. The contralateral, it looks very necrotic like you would expect. Uh, but they had done a couple of different biopsies, both of which came back positive for Coxie. And he's from, he's from the Hayward-Stockton area, so certainly in the region of Coxie exposure. And this has been growing over two or three months, and so they're going to take it out now or soon. They're putting him on different therapy because it's been failing. So, so it, any particular ethnicity here? Because the Filipinos living in the Central Valley were particularly prone Good question. I think he's he's actually African American. Yeah, and I included that in here. Um, yeah. So, but we've seen it in Caucasians as well. But you're right, David. Yeah, because you'd made that point before that it's usually or more often Latinos and others. But we've seen so much of it now, or I've started to see so much of it now that we see it in everybody. Just less. Has anyone seen that before? A chest wall lesion that big from coxie? I haven't seen one this big. For, so. for causing bone lesions, though, so this is, I think this is a probably, probably seated anterior rib, don't you think? And, um, oh, you know, yeah. speaking, of, yeah. speaking of seating, thank you. I even forgot that, yeah, on this most recent one, he clearly has miliary nodules. It's kind of interesting that his, he has a portion of his left lower lobe that's spared. And I don't really have a great explanation for that, but it looks like the airways are, are viable there. But yeah, that was the other, yeah, I forgot to mention that too, that he's oh, now got pretty disseminated just, disease. In that area, the vessels are very small. You wonder if there's like a yeah. thrombus or something in there that prevented dissemination. Or, or how about another oh, CPAP? Or lobar emphysema. Actually, yeah, that's a, you know, that's a, that's, yeah, that's a bad location for something congenital. Agreed. It does look like his airways are, he's got normal airway branching pattern, it looks like, in that left lower lobe, so I don't know. Does it actually get in there? It I looks so. Like, uh, you're right. Maybe, well, maybe he had prior pneumonia and ended up with bronchiectasis down here. That doesn't explain why it's not involved now, but he's just got, because it kind of looks like old infection with these bronchiectatic airways. So with the miliary pattern, I think it probably supports the notion of hematogenous dissemination of the yeah. organism to the rib or cartilage, and then it just randomly took off from there. Yeah. I guess. Let's see. On this original radiograph, thanks for reminding me. Let's see. Yeah, he had the lymphadenopathy, right paratracheal here, probably a little along his prevascular space, even back on that one of those older radiographs. So. He's not obviously immunosuppressed in some fashion, is he? 
So no, he's not. Him. Otherwise healthy. All right. Jeff, I'll stop for there. All right. Thank you. All right, I have a couple I can show in the remaining time. Let's see. All right. So you should be seeing well, lateral, but we want a frontal radiograph. And um, let's make sure we put that side by side. So this is a pretty classic case, but it's a nice one where we can see the abnormality on the radiograph. And um, I don't remember the exact history on this patient, but uh, for educational purposes, we could say the patient was having um, embolic phenomena. But you can see on the lateral, there's a rounded calcification in the region of the left atrium, a little bit harder to localize on the frontal radiograph, but I think you can see it right there, sort of just to the right of the spine. And here is the CT. Not very often we see this on a radiograph, but the classic appearance of a myxoma here with extremely dense calcification rising from the fossil vallis. So the classic left atrial myxoma, but it's cool because you can actually see it on the radiograph. And, the, and as a matter of fact, the, the aortic valve is not normal either. You can see calcification and thickening, but looks like it has three leaflets. Okay, um, here's an interesting smoke case. I don't think I showed you guys this one yet. So this one, I'm fortunate to have multiple phases of imaging from different studies. I've got, um, here's the most recent one. This is a, so this was a, this is a, a chest CT. You can see there's a good uh, right heart and pulmonary arterial uh, enhancement. But you can see some really nice smoke in the left atrium on this study. There's sort of some sluggish flow, some slow mixing in the left atrium, and it almost looks like there's thrombus in the left superior pulmonary vein. And the reason there, there's no flow is because there's, there's a occlusion of the uh, left upper lobe pulmonary artery. So this patient had had a, a cancer that had been treated with radiation chemotherapy, and so the, the, the vein is shut down, but you can see there's sluggish sort of mixing in that area. Now what's cool is we found some older studies. Here's one from a couple of months before, and we still see that slow, that absent flow in the vein, but you see less of the, now that we're more on a, on a sort of a left, a, right, a left circulation side, you see there's that smoke in the left atrium has gone away. You see a little bit in that right inferior pulmonary vein. And then if I jump back um, even further, here's one. So here we can see uh, you can see the it's almost all in the right heart pulmonary arteries at this point. And if we look, there's even more smoke in this left atrium, presumably because of differential re slow return were early. But just a nice uh, case that really illustrates that you can get all sorts of mixing artifacts and they can vary between studies. Um, and then in this case, we've got you've got even slow flow in the left atrial appendage. And uh, there was a, an abdominal CT from that same day that there you go. We just catch the bottom of it, but you can see that homogeneous enhancement then occurs. So, you know, Jeff, I have to say, we with this CTEF clinic we have here, and we see all these CTEF patients. It's amazing the way that the um, hypotenuating, unpacified blood flowing into the left atrium, squeezing in, kind of shooting in, really directs you to where the most, the largest burden of clot is. Yeah, um, it's it's really interesting. Like you you'll see. Two of the two of the four pulmonary veins completely pacified. The other ones are completely dark, and that really helps guide you. It's it's just an interesting, as you're pointing, kind of physiologic. Yeah, I mean, you can look. Yeah, it's it's a fascinating find. And now when I see it, I I carefully go back and look. Yeah, see what's going on. So, so Seth, you use it as a that's interesting. You use it as a clue to look at, to know which arteries to look at. To really. It, it, to really look at and those are the ones that almost are always the most affected um or at least have the most occlusion uh and it's just something i've noticed just coming here and just seeing yeah. the volume that we see that you'll see you know it, they might be opposite pulmonary veins and the left upper and the right lower and those are the ones right inferior and those are the ones that have the worst disease makes just sense. something i mean like in yeah, this case sense. with the left upper low pulmonary artery being out that left superior pulmonary vein looks like it exactly. has a lot in it Exactly. Yeah. 
This is a cool case, and I have never seen this phenomenon before, and I'm curious if anyone else has. Julie, Julie Takasugi sent me this case. I, it's a fascinating case. It's a good, great teaching case. So this was a patient who had an esophagectomy, and this is the uh, one of the post-operative graphs fairly early. You can see the um, there's a gastric tube in, there's a PIC, and then there's the epidural catheter. And the important thing to notice is the location of the gastric tube. The, conduit, the right peritracheal thickening is related to the conduit, and you can see it's, there's some gas in here. So it's nicely tucked in the mediastinum, which is typically where the surgeons park these things. Now, here's the next day, and I'll put them up side by side. There, and you should be able to see both of them, I hope. If not, you'll notice on the image on your left, or screen right, uh, I'm backward to my right, <laughs> the gastric tube is now moved over to the right. And you can see it's kind of got a bowing to it yet, and there's a little bit more sort of outward bowing of the mediastinum. It's, it's, that's, so there's a little difference in rotation, but clearly this is no longer over the midline. And um, so Julie, they had raised the question that there was clearly some mass effect on this thing and we're worried about a leak. But it's, you know, it's one of those classic ones, the patient looks fine. Um, and so they didn't do much about it right away, but eventually, and then they actually um, did a swallow, which I can see if I make it bigger here. And the swallow was, for whatever reason, really didn't show much. You can see the, oh shoot, there it goes. I'm trying to get it back here. Where did it go? I just had the one image, but you can see the contrast is going on this side. The problem with these conduits is sometimes they all, the, it's hard to find the leak if you don't really maneuver the patient a lot because they, you know, it's, an, it's often an inside astimo, anastomosis, and it may, as in this case, just trickle down one side. Well, if you have a medial leak, um, I always find it good, important to sort of roll the patient around a little bit, best you could, and try to get different projections, because those leaks can be subtle. But what's really cool is the CT here. And I'll scroll down, and you can see, so there's a communicate uh, right up in the, in the area here, there's already gas so where they would have done the um, high anastomosis, and then there's this debris, you can see suture material, but then it's displacing this lumen far to the right, this big fluid collection. Now, this occurred about a month after those radiographs, just slightly, about three and a half weeks after those radiographs. And you can see, indeed, this is a, there's the conduit, whoops, I'm going to go back. Uh, but this is a contained, was it, well, it was a leak that somewhat contained at this point. So it's probably a very small leak, but at the time following surgery, you know, there was enough mass effect on this thing to suggest that um, something's going on. Now, I've never made that observation before, and I don't. I wonder if at times I, it's been there, I haven't noticed it. But now I'm very attuned to it um, when I'm thinking about um, esophagectomy patients because uh, usually they get they, they'll see an effusion or they don't they get a fever and we'll CT them and find the leak. But I don't know if any of you ever seen this either prospectively or retrospectively on radiographs where you see a displaced drain indicating a leak or su suggesting a leak. Nope, not seen one before. Seth, Seth's going to say that's pretty obvious. Well, oh, what? The leak? Yes. Just, yeah. just like the uh, torsion. That's pretty obvious. Oh, yeah. No, of course. <laughs> <laughs> well, add it, to, add it to your list of observations to check on. I, I was actually reading emails. I didn't even see, and I don't see anything. I just looked up. It looks like. <laughs> I don't. Where, where's the leak? So I'll show, well, let me show you the other radiograph again. Um, we had, these are radiographs a day apart. And what you can see is that the gastric tube was midline and then it's being displaced over to the right. Oh yeah, obvious. Yeah. And then a CT done a little bit later. I don't know why these are out of sight. Yeah, I'm just gonna delete that, there we go. Um, wow. You scroll down, here's Seth. See this nasty. Uh, uh. Yeah. Okay, well, that's it. Thanks, guys, for the wonderful cases. Happy New Year, everybody. And, Happy New Year. Um, you feel better, Jeff. You sound, uh, you sound under the weather. Oh, I feel great. It's just the cold weather is, you know. Jeff? Yes. Well, I, forgot to get, I forgot it gets cold in places now. I, I'm yeah. sorry about that. Could I, could I briefly show the, uh, the uh, right, sorry, the left lower lobe lesion that I missed showing earlier? Just, just one quick okay. pass here. Of course. Get bonus okay. Time today. okay, so this is the CT scan showing the nodule in the right lower lobe that turned out to be a rheumatoid nodule, not a fungal infection. And that was several months after this CT scan, which shows a left lower lobe lesion, roughly the same location with cavitation. This was a 
fungal infection to a species of Aspergillus. So uh, sort of matching lesions, and you can tell why these people, the people were very suspicious of recurrent fungal infection when they got the later CT scan. Yep. Cool. All right. Thank All right. you. Thanks. Thanks, everybody. Have a good week. Bye. Yeah. Bye-bye. Take care, guys.